In the 21st century, the risks and dangers of operating your standard car are well known to all. From fender benders to head-on collisions, hydroplaning, and tire blowouts, any number of these can and do happen while traveling by motor vehicle. And while we may have many transportation laws and regulations today that aim to mitigate these dangers, this was not always the case. For instance, at the turn of the 20th century, as the automobile first made its appearance on the road, it created extremely hazardous conditions for drivers and pedestrians alike, so much so that an outright battle over the very moral and ethic nature of the automobile exploded across countries like the United States. And the staggering amount of damage, death, and injury caused by lack of regulation and safety measures over automobiles soon painted an extremely damning picture for the motor industry as a whole. It was during this uncertain time at the outset of the 1900s that the future of motor vehicle transportation was intensely debated. All the while, people, including children, were being injured and killed by the thousands in the streets. This was the tumultuous birth of the automobile, a true horror in history. By the early 1900s, estimates show there to have been around 200,000 motor vehicles on the road in 1909 surging to roughly 2 million by 1916. The roadways of America, especially in cities, had become much more congested, not to mention louder, from the grumbling noises that emanated from the early motor engines. This especially angered those who continued to rely on the traditional horse and carriage for their transportation needs, due to financial reasons, or just plain conservative ideals when it came to the novel automobile. Besides their disruptive nature, Early automobiles did not possess any safety features. In the 1890s and first decade of the 1900s, most were open air, more closely resembling a horseless carriage with a steering wheel, rather than the more recognizable vehicles that would emerge in the coming decades. Some would not even be mounted with a windshield, and even then, those that were would see the windshield shatter into large dagger-like shards upon the vehicle wrecking, causing all sorts of ghastly injuries to the driver, and sometimes even death. Seat belts were also nowhere to be found, so if a vehicle were to roll over, the driver and any occupants would be sent flying from the cab into the street, or left crushed under the vehicle itself. One example was that of a bridal couple, several wedding guests, and three children in a vehicle having an accident, the press describing their automobile as having turned turtle, as it was called, at 40 miles per hour, spilling out the occupants in many bottles of liquor into the street. And the dangers didn't stop at driving alone. Just starting the engine could result in significant injuries. A driver was required to use a separate hand crank that would be inserted into the engine block at the front of the vehicle. This was a time before electric key start ignition switches, so the pistons in the engine would have to be started manually. All of this fiddling with the engine block could result in a backfire, causing the hand crank to whip back in the driver's direction. This typically left someone with a broken wrist or arm, called chauffeur's fracture, as in big cities like New York, the wealthy were driven by chauffeurs, who primarily operated the vehicles and received the brunt of such injuries. Indeed, heated debates simmered over the existential threat the automobile was pretending upon the roadways. In 1909, a Georgia Court of Appeals ruled the vehicles as ferocious animals, and that laws pertaining to the owners of such animals was to be duly applied to the drivers of automobiles, should harm come to anyone at their fault. While automobiles continued to remain almost exclusively with the wealthy in big cities such as New York, other metropolitan areas in the United States like Detroit saw the automobile adopted by all social classes, further complicating matters in the street. What initially transpired as use delegated solely to service vehicles such as ambulances, motorized taxis, and the like, ownership of automobiles expanded to the public as manufacturing costs came down and affordability went up. Big cities were now packed with the noisy machines, while horse-drawn carriages continued to trot alongside, and the booming urban population grew as more and more families moved into cities for work opportunities. For those who decided to take public transportation in the form of streetcars, a veritable gauntlet of dangers awaited them upon departure. 
They would need to dodge and weave their way past vehicles accelerating at 20 miles per hour or more, along with the still serviceable workhorses that stamped their way down city avenues. Most could not accurately judge the speed of oncoming vehicles, and with streetcars running in the middle of the road, it was perhaps the most dangerous place a 1900s pedestrian could find themselves in. The main concern the public and authorities had over the vehicles was their speed. In the first decade of the 20th century, standard traffic safety measures like stop signs, traffic lights, crosswalks, and speed limits did not exist. It was a complete free-for-all of wanton recklessness as America blindly embraced the automobile age. In 1917, there were 65,000 motor vehicles in and around Detroit, causing 7,171 accidents and 168 fatalities, with three-quarters of the victims being pedestrians, the majority of which were children. In the early 1900s, children's playgrounds were virtually non-existent. Children simply played where they always had, in and around the thoroughfare. Before automobiles, it was easy enough to move out of the way of an oncoming horse buggy, usually going no faster than five miles per hour. With no speed limit or traffic signs in place within city limits, it was common for most drivers to simply carry on at speed through busy streets. By the 1920s, 60% of automobile fatalities nationwide were children under the age of nine. In one instance, an Italian family living in Detroit lost their 18-month-old child to an automobile accident. The child had been hit in the street and became lodged in the wheel well of the vehicle. Upon the police and the father prying the child's body free, the mother went back into the house and committed suicide. Another incident was reported in Detroit in June 1919, wherein a group of several children aged two to nine years were the victims of a hit and run. The children were playing in the street on a Saturday afternoon when a red automobile sped through, running them all down. The driver's vehicle stalled before they leapt out, cranked it, and sped away. The children left critically injured. As such tragic incidents became more prominent, condemnation of drivers in particular became more vindictive, with the press labeling them as remorseless murderers, and their threat to the public being attributed to that not unlike an epidemic disease. In another horrific incident, a young woman had accidentally jumped the curb, plowing through a crowd on the sidewalk, killing several people. She was detained in her 26th arrest for reckless driving and mentioned that she suffered from blackouts. Angry mobs resorted to chasing down reckless drivers and pulling them out of their vehicles and assaulting them. Authorities knew they needed tighter control and tougher laws on managing traffic. As early traffic laws were being developed, city governments began public awareness campaigns urging caution over the use of automobiles. Police officers visited school classrooms reading the names of children and how they were killed by reckless drivers, in addition to teachers showing murder maps, pointing out where deceased children had been run over. And in the streets, the masses gathered as the city held safety parades, wherein children marched along dressed as little ghosts to represent those killed by automobiles, while grieving mothers followed behind wearing gold or white stars to symbolize that they had lost a child. Wrecked vehicles were also showcased, featuring bloodied mannequins in the driver's seats as crippled children, victims of traffic accidents, waved to their peers from the back seats of passing cars. Detroit would go on to lead the United States by example in tackling the many issues rapidly growing from the introduction of motor vehicles to public streets. Tougher laws were enacted on those who drove recklessly. A driver was often fined, jailed, and charged with manslaughter or murder if they ran over a pedestrian. The city established a traffic squad from the local police force. Though, using only hand signals, these officers often only caused confusion amongst drivers, having to chase down many to explain what the signals meant. By 1916, over a quarter of the entire police force was designated as traffic officers, and in 1920, Following New York's lead, Detroit established the second traffic court in the nation. That same day, it was reported that the 17th person in the city had been killed in the month of May by an automobile, the eighth child that month. 
Bells from churches, schools, and fire stations began to toll twice per day in memoriam of the dead. But even as the dangers persisted and the death toll rose, it became clear that the automobile wasn't going anywhere and that it had indeed become essential for travel in an industrialized world. The first stop sign went up in Detroit in 1915, and the city was also the first to design and implement the first traffic lights, originally called street semaphores. A police officer would stand inside a raised crow's nest planted in the street, operating a set of switches that would light up a green metal circle or a red metal star, signaling for drivers to stop or go. The officers would blow a whistle 10 seconds before changing the lights, alerting drivers to use caution. By 1922, the first unmanned electric street semaphore was developed and established, an automated bell signaling motorists at the light changes. These progressive changes to traffic management would become known as the Detroit Plan and would be adopted in other cities across the country. As the decades went on, manufacturers began adding further safety features to their vehicles, such as turn signals and shatterproof glass. By the 1930s, U.S. states were requiring drivers to take tests and acquire licenses, in addition to taking driver's education. And finally, in 1950, seat belts were added as a safety feature to most cars, airbags following the year after. The age of the automobile had completed its transition into the modern era of motor vehicle travel. The majority of the world has since embraced motor transportation since the turn of the 20th century. However, a number of places exist today where cars are still seldom used or outright prohibited by law. These are largely small island nations, or in the case of Mackinac Island off the northern tip of Michigan in Lake Huron, a resort island and historic national park. Visit and you're likely to get a small taste of what the world of transportation was like in early 20th century America. The island banned all motor vehicles in 1898, a measure that many at the time had hoped would pass nationwide. Today, only emergency and service vehicles are allowed on the island, in addition to snowmobiles during the winter. Otherwise, the island's inhabitants travel the four square mile landmass by foot, bicycle, or horse. It's very common to still see passengers being towed along by horse-drawn carriage, while dozens of bicycles line the city streets. For the rest of the world, traveling by car is the safest it has ever been, relatively speaking, despite occasional documented spikes in auto fatalities. This is largely due to the fact that just about every action taken while behind the wheel has some rule or law attached to it. But it was a long, grueling road of trial and error that brought us to where we are today. A road lined with the dead who fell victim to the bloody birth of the automobile, making it a true horror in history. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Thanks for watching Horrors and History.